For the past six years, Pulse has commissioned the Debit Issuer Study, which has become the industry benchmark for tracking debit performance and trends. The study engages a broad cross-section of financial institutions across the country, collectively representing some 50 million debit card holders. This deep dive into the perspective and performance of debit card issuers provides a unique view of where the industry is headed. The 2011 edition of the Debit Issuer Study reached beyond metrics typically covered every year to include issuers' feedback about the Durban Amendment and the proposed debit card rules issued by the Fed. Joining me today is Tony Hayes, partner at Oliver Wyman. Tony has served as the project lead on the Debit Issuer Study since its inception. Tony, thanks for joining me today. One of the interesting findings in this study is that despite their exemption from the interchange provision in the Durban Amendment, small issuers expect a pretty significant decline in their interchange revenue, 73 percent as a matter of fact. Were you surprised by that number being so large? Well, to be honest, Steve, we didn't know what to expect when we began this study. Because as you know, on the one hand, the Durban Amendment explicitly excludes issuers with less than $10 billion in assets from the interchange regulation whereas issuers above $10 billion uh, will be subject to an interchange uh, cap, which the proposed rule is between seven to 12 cents. On the other hand, Ben Bernanke and others have questioned whether or not the exemption will be effective uh, or whether or not pricing will converge to the lowest common denominator. So we asked issuers, uh, we said, you know, what do you expect will happen once the Dublin rule goes into effect? And um, what we found is that, as you said, exempt issuers are anticipating a 73% 70, decline in the interchange revenue. So now we have it, you know, first-hand feedback in terms of what expectations are, and it's very clear. Uh, and I think in that, in that respect, yes, we are pretty surprised by how dramatic the decline is. So given that outlook for interchange revenue, issuers are certainly re-evaluating their overall strategy for demand deposit accounts. What are some of the most substantial changes being contemplated right now? Well, Steve, if you look at a bank's customer base, you can divide up into three main categories, low balance customers, mid balance customers, and high balance customers. About half of the entire customer base falls into that middle category. And for that group, debit interchange revenue represents about a third of their income. If that goes away, these accounts are no longer economically viable. You simply have to make changes. So what we are seeing and what we anticipate seeing more of are a number of things. First and foremost will be fees. And we'll see fees in terms of monthly fees, statement fees, check image fees, ATM fees, uh, a whole panoply of new charges that didn't exist in the past are being introduced or may be introduced. Secondly, we're also seeing a move to higher balance or higher minimum balance requirements in order to qualify for certain fee waivers. We're also seeing a consideration of moving people away from debit products towards exempt payment products. Uh, and lastly, there's a a review of the overall cost base that a bank incurs and potentially including a transformation of the branch network. Rewards programs are another area of focus for issuers. However, despite widespread industry speculation that rewards days are numbered in a post-Durban environment, only 54 percent of institutions surveyed are actually reassessing their programs at this time. Did you expect that number to be larger? Let me offer a couple of observations. The first is the 54% is for the overall market. If you look just at regulated FIs, 67% of them expect that they're going to change or eliminate their rewards programs versus only 30 or so percent for the smaller FIs. What this means is if we do move to a world of bifurcated interchange, we could have smaller FIs offering much uh, richer reward propositions than the larger bank counterparts. Secondly, in terms of rewards programs themselves, we, we're certainly going to see the end of issuer-funded generic points programs. What we won't see, though, is an end to loyalty programs in general. They are going to morph. Some will move towards more merchant-funded programs, but more, more generally, I think we're going to see a move towards overall bank reward programs or loyalty programs that enhance the overall banking relationship. Concerning the network exclusivity provision, not surprisingly, issuers prefer alternative A, two unaffiliated networks per card. What was the feedback that you heard from issuers about overall network participation? Sure. I think the first comment, and what is widely appreciated even now, uh, is the network participation requirement within Durban applies to every uh, issuer in the whole country. All 15,000 odd banks and credit unions across the country are subject to this requirement. So in terms of alternative B, 
which has been, was floated in the proposed rule, two signature networks and two pin networks per card, the feedback we got loud and clear is we simply don't know how we could do this. It's very, very operationally difficult and, and expensive, quite, quite frankly. Uh, and so therefore, it leads you towards alternative A as being one, practical, and two, also compliant with what the statute actually says of two unaffiliated networks. And so there's a general sense of it's very hard to change these affiliations. Uh, and if it's not necessary to be compliant with the rules, let's simply not overreach in terms of what, what's being expected. And Tony, lastly, with the convergence of PIN and signature interchange rates for regulated issuers in a post-Durban environment, you heard from some issuers in the survey that they would begin to promote PIN more because of its better all-in economics. Do you think the Durban Amendment will ultimately serve as a catalyst for a surge in PIN debit use? I think we are going to see a shift uh, away from signature towards PIN, but a surge may be uh, overly, uh, is, is probably less likely. The fact is, uh, with, as the rates converge, there's less incentive for merchants to add more PIN pads. But there's also no reason for an issuer to promote signature over PIN. In fact, quite the opposite, to your point. Where I do think we're going to see material change is for card not present environments, in particular for debit use on the internet, where fraud and chargebacks are, are, are a material concern. In that case, uh, we, I do expect we're going to see a massive adoption of PIN debit online, which is a lower cost method for merchants, uh, and also a better value proposition for the issuers. Well, Tony, thanks for joining us today to talk about some of these findings. We really appreciate your time. Thank you. And Tony and I covered just a portion of the Durban-related findings in the 2011 Debit Issuer Study. For a comprehensive look at this topic, download the executive summary. You can find it under the White Papers tab right here on the Pulse Durban Amendment Resource Center. Thank you for joining us today.